Welcome to the Valley Queens podcast. Tonight, we will be talking about parking regulations with Tony Jordan. Tony is the founder and president of the Parking Reform Network. Tony has been organizing for parking reforms for seven years and was the founder of Portlanders for Parking Reform. Tony has a bachelor in politics from UC Santa Cruz and has worked as a union organizer and software developer. He is passionate about parking and is a regular speaker at regional and national conferences. He also writes about parking at the Parking Minute. So welcome to the Valley Queens podcast, which is a podcast about addressing systemic issues that we encounter through our everyday experiences and our daily living. Um, tonight, we have Tony Jordan with us. Tony, please introduce yourself and tell us why is parking your thing? <laughs> well, hello, thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Tony Jordan and I am the co-founder and president of an organization called the Parking Reform Network, which is a organization with a mission to kind of educate the public about the impact of parking policy on housing affordability, climate change, traffic, violence and traffic, the way our assisted cities function. Um, and uh, and I think parking, I, I got into parking by reading this book by Don Shoup called The High Cost of Free Parking about 12 years ago, I read it. And I just realized how much of an impact it has on our cities. Uh, I had never thought about why uh, parking was why it was, like why it was there, how it got there, uh, why it cost that much. And, and really, once I started to learn about that, it just, it struck me as such a uh, important topic that touched on so many issues that I think are critical and that I care about. So, okay. Like people think about parking and they actually don't think about parking that much unless they get like a no. parking ticket, then they think about right. it a lot. Uh, I just missed like my court appointment to, um, <laughs> like debate my parking ticket because I live in an apartment building and um, there is restricted overnight parking. So I forgot that I parked it in front of my apartment and I left it overnight and then I got a ticket. So that leads me to the question of like, how do parking, how do parking regulations um, really, why is it important to our daily lives? Like how does it affect it really? Yeah, well, um, I, I think that that I mean, obviously, since most car most trips in the United States, because of the way we built our cities are by car, right? And and most almost all housing in the United States, outside of a few places, has required parking. The the kind of assumption is that you're getting around at least some of your day by car. So so given that you're interacting, you know, you have to, your car has to be somewhere where you're not in it, which is most of the time. I obviously, I think just naturally parking is, is important um, and impacts your life because you have to, you know, you have, you have to get in and out of that car and go from point A to point B. Um, and even if you don't own a car, you know, you have to navigate, you know, other cars that are parked, driveways, um, you know, and, and it impacts how our cities are built. Okay. So, why, why did you start your organization? What prompted you to do that? Was it a specific well, incident or was it a longstanding love of parking regulations? <laughs> well, and I, I, you know, before I started Parking Reform Network, I had started an organization called Portlanders for Parking Reform. So I live in Portland, Oregon. I should have mentioned that in the intro, but I live in Portland, Oregon. And, um, and that, the 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 impetus behind that was uh, in around 2012. My the, there was uh, some apartments being built without parking in um, some of our uh, commercial corridors. The street called Division Street and a, another and, and, and uh, um, Williams uh, Street in a different part of town. Mm -hmm. And um, and it got to a point where there was kind of a breaking point where this one apartment. A lot of these had been like 50. 50, 60 unit apartment buildings um, 
with no parking. And the neighbors didn't like that. And then there was like a 90 unit parking building, a, a 90 a apartment with 90 homes in it with no car parking. And that kind of like snapped the neighbors in the in the area. And so they there was a big battle to like say like this is destroying the neighborhood. Like we didn't think about this. Sure, it's good on paper, but like we don't have good enough transit. And uh, and so they pushed back. And and at that point, I I wanted to get um, I, I I wanted to organize neighbors to try and stop the city from doing that, from adding new parking requirements. So Sorry. what happened? Uh, we lost uh, <laughs> Portland in 2013. Portland added parking requirements back in. They weren't like huge compared to a lot of cities, but they did add parking requirements if you built like more than 31 homes in an apartment building. Um, and then over, you know, and so, so that was that happened. But then I decided I was going to, you know, form this organization to kind of like stop that from happening again. And so a few years later, when they tried to expand those requirements into another part of town, we were able to to push back and and stop that from happening in Northwest Portland. So why did you want the no no parking requirements for that um, rental unit for those apartment buildings? Well, after, you know, and I read the high cost of free parking, I learned how much parking, I, I started to realize how much parking cost, like, so, which I think is the, the core question, like, people don't, like, if you're building an apartment building, and in Portland, like, you know, especially if you're building infill developments in a place where you don't have, like, not a suburban development, um, usually you have to build parking structured, so either above ground in like a parking, like but you're like not not surface lot, so structured parking, and that can cost easily, you know, twenty to fifty thousand dollars a parking space, right. and so like there's kind of a rule of like you know you, uh, every thousand dollars is you know like a um, hundred dollars I think in in we know that's not right. Uh, well, it could be like $500, basically like a $50,000 right. parking space is going to cost about $500 for, mm -hmm. um, you know, rent. It has to, you know, to pay out the financing, et cetera. And so it really makes it extremely expensive. And that was, and I also, like, I'm a cyclist and I, and I don't really like uh, after the other externalities of car driving and, and car use. So, so by building this parking in the, my city, I felt like you're inviting even like the streets are already congested. And so if you build like a parking structure or more parking, you're inviting even more cars into the city. And that has all these other downstream impacts. So, okay. So parking off street parking, because that's what you were yeah. talking about off street parking, which is parking uh, that some you know, in some areas, it's, it's a requirement in some towns. For example, in my town in Valley Stream, it's a requirement for any apartment building to provide off-street parking. The requirement is at least one space per apartment unit, I believe. Um, and it depends on how big the apartment unit and things like that. So that increases rent prices, right? Most likely, yes. Yeah, I mean, unless so, it happens to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I read the, I listened to the book. It was a 24 hour book on parking. <laughs> and the only way I can describe it is it's exactly what you would think a 24 hour book on parking is like, like, <laughs> that's what it was. Um, but yeah, but there's a science and there's evidence and there's research suggesting that, of course, that adds price to the rental units um, and to housing. Um, so what's the alternative if there's no off street parking? Well, the alternative is not necessarily for there to be no off street parking. Uh, you know, the, the, what, one of the first things is just to stop requiring it. So that may mean that it, because, because the parking requirements as they are this one per unit or in commercial, they're even different, they're crazier is, is it's usually cities try to like, you know, the, 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 it's a guess. There is there is no science of how much parking is required because it's a site by site and a contextual concern. Um, so, for example, like a city might often say, "Okay, we're gonna," you know, we understand that not everyone who like if you live near transit, you might not need a lot of off street parking. So we'll like reduce it, but we'll say we're gonna reduce it within four or five hundred feet of a bus line. 
So that seems okay to a lot of people, but then there might be an apartment building that's built 450 feet from the bus line. And really effectively, that doesn't make a difference for how mm -hmm. transit accessible it is. But then you might require, you know, 50 parking spaces and, and make that, I mean, make that that project maybe not even happen. I mean, that's the other side of the coin is that on one hand, it makes housing that is built more expensive, but even perhaps perhaps more dangerous is the housing that doesn't get built because you're requiring parking, because you can't find financing or you can't put enough, or even maybe you build an apartment building, but instead of 60 homes in it, you only put 30 homes in it because you had to put 30 parking mm -hmm. spaces. And so then all of a sudden now you're just you're just not building. I mean, you know, housing needs to be affordable and abundant. And if you're not building abundant housing, it's probably not going to be affordable either. So I think, you know, um, so the key would be to like let let initially just, you know, let developers honestly, they don't they got to sell their product. So they're not going to not build it if they need to sell it and then use a couple other strategies. You can use some other strategies like, uh, you know, well, obviously managing on-street parking that exists, the existing, you know, right of way in a good way that allows access. And then you can do some other things like, like increase, um, change, some, many cities regulate, like if you have a commercial parking lot, like it can only be used for commercial parking. Like it can't be used for like a bank mm -hmm. have a parking lot and the bank can't let residents park there at night. So you can change those regulations in order to allow for more efficient use of the existing supply. Um, so those are some ways like as an alternative, but the key is like parking, there's already so much, par I just think there's already so much parking in almost every city that it, it's gonna take a long time before you really run out of parking if you don't require it in new housing. We don't unfortunately even build enough new housing to like make that, uh, that's a good problem we would have. <laughs> <laughs> what does it look like when there is too much parking in a in a suburban town for example what does it look like when there's too much parking well i mean aesthetically you know what i mean aesthetically can, yes <laughs> i mean you you know I, I think you have like places that aren't well, I mean, parking, first of all, you know, spreads everything out, parking requirements or excess parking spreads everything out. So like if you have a large parking requirement for a restaurant, then your area for restaurants, then in your area where people want to go for entertainment, you know, your buildings will be spread apart by surface parking usually or parking structures that make the, the streetscape not walkable. Um, or, you know, you can look at overhead maps of many cities, uh, especially you know, cities that, that changed a lot in the 60s and 70s where they were kind of hollowed out or, um, or even just like you, you, in many smaller towns, you, you can really, you can go to the old town Main Street and see what a city without excess parking looks like. It's a nice place to be, you know, buildings with housing above them and, you know, shops. And then you can go to the newer part of town, which is usually like a bunch of gas stations, box stores and strip malls and see what the difference is very starkly within often just a couple miles of each other. Um, so I think, yeah, it's um, pretty, pretty, maybe easy to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting because I know um, in the book, it also talks about the suburban sprawl that is also caused by like parking requirements and adding a lot of parking. And most of the parking is not used a lot of the time. And um, they were talking about kind of like the magic number of how populated the parking is, the density right. of parking, which they said was 85%. What yeah, is, the, can I, you, can you explain ahead. that to us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like that's this idea of like the the optim the optimal like occupancy like the the uh, of the utilization rate of the parking uh, that often applies more. So that that eighty five percent is is a common, particularly for on street parking, is a good kind of like it's not a set figure, but it's like a good ballpark number for if you've got uh, you know like about ten spaces on a block face 
Mm -hmm. 10 parking spaces for cars. Um, then if you have 85% occupancy, then, you know, usually you're going to have one or two empty parking spaces on, on, on average on a block face in a city center. So as, as someone's driving around, they can park on the block where they're going, which is convenient for them and also reduces the amount of cruising, which is just extra miles that where you might hit somebody. You're usually making a lot of churns. It's extra emissions. Um, people get frustrated. So like having that occupancy of 85% is usually a, a great marker for on-street um, utilization. I don't know really, honestly, for like a uh, mall parking lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like, you know, strong towns or other places have gone and looked at like on Black Friday, you know, when it's supposed to be full and they're not even full. Like, I don't know. There's a whole probably different calculation for what your off street utilization is. But I do know that like um, there is some uh, research from Chicago where like they looked at transit oriented development or apartment. Often when people do survey uh, apartment buildings, particularly transit oriented developments that are near transit stations, like there is underutilized parking. If they're, if they're requiring one or two spaces or two spaces per apartment, a lot of times, you know, you're docking six fifty or 60% utilization. So I think like for off street, ideally your utilization should be a hundred percent because, or, 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 or almost there, you know, because you want to just efficiently use, you know, I guess 85 probably is, you know, efficient too, but yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Kind of got right. lost there. <laughs> no, it's, it's just interesting because I'm kind of trying to think about like, for example, in Valley Stream in our town, we have like a main street, right? Which is uh, right. Rockaway Avenue. And I'm, I'm thinking the utilization is about 70, 75 during like a busy time, uh, which is all right, I guess. Mm -hmm. But then I'm thinking like literally like a block from that is our park and the parking there is, it has a huge parking lot and it's always like a less than 10% except like one day of the year where they have like a fair or something there. Right, right. So like, is that wasted space? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> it certainly would. I mean, probably. I mean, you could imagine like if your community requires parking for new developments, like could that parking lot be used for you know for residential parking in the evening or you know or you know if if there were you know if you allowed a uh, higher intensity business development in that district could that could that be used or if it's really that underutilized like yeah maybe it should be more park space or or i mean food carts. I don't know. There's many things you can do in a yes. parking space. <laughs> so uh, that leads me to my next question, which is there's like a debate going on about the idea of car space versus people space versus mm -hmm. green spaces, right? What sort of like parking regulations or ordinances or strategies lead to bringing back the space towards the people versus towards the cars? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, I mean, uh, uh, starting with not requiring parking, that's the first thing, because then you're going to give space to the cars first. And now, and to mention, you know, remember, parking is like the end point. And if you add more parking, eventually you have to add more road, right? Like, because if your road's already congested and you add more parking, so that's going to take away even more space or, or prevent you from using space for bus lanes or parklets, you know, so we've seen obviously in many, many communities during the pandemic, you know, the relaxation of regulations about using parking, either in parking lots or on street for things like street seats um, or other active uses. So that's one way, obviously, you can you can do that. We're seeing that happen everywhere. Um, I think we'll hit a point where we have to talk about the privatization of those spaces without, you know, if they're, you know, like businesses should probably you know, pay the city if they're using public space for their commercial endeavor, but, but there's many other uses for them. Just, you know, if they're public seating, that's fine. You know, that's a great thing or letting people um, often it's just like a requirement of what you have to, you know, it, 
the required parking can't be used for something else. So like I have an, uh, actually there's a, a preschool in my neighborhood here that's gonna, it's actually gonna close. And the, oh. the, the, the chain of events that led to this preschool closing is that they had, uh, they had put bark chips and built a playground over a bunch of this church's old parking lot that no one was still using. And eventually a neighbor got mad and they made a complaint. And, you know, they were either going to have to remove all the playground. It, it was, it, I won't go into the whole details. It's very complicated, but like, you know, if, if your city has a mandated parking requirement, you're usually only allowed to use that parking for cars. You can't even do anything else with it. So like, mm -hmm. I think, you can't just relax those requirements and say, we don't care anymore what you're doing with the parking space you have, you know, put anything in it you want. Why do you think these like very strict, very um, demanding parking requirements came from? Where do they come from? Like, what is, what was the point? You know, the, I don't know if there's, I mean, I, there's there's a lot of theories on this. So I think, um, you know, I wrote a, I co-wrote an article, which I think is how you, uh, how we, you got in touch with me uh, about like racism in parking uh, with a, a friend of mine, uh, Ed Mendoza from, he's a graduate of USC planning student or graduate now. Um, and, uh, and he did some research like into Los Angeles and like, about when their parking requirements came into place. And he, you know, wrote a fairly compelling, uh, you know, piece in that article that these came about in order to, like, people were afraid of their neighborhoods changing and, and immigrant populations moving in or, or other populations moving into low-income populations moving into neighborhoods. Um, and, and one way this isn't where all parking requirements may come from, but one way to like slow that that spread is to to require parking in multifamily housing. So if you you know as for reasons we talked about the space and the cost. So by kind of imposing this suburban lifestyle of having a car in your driveway, um, that's one way to do it. Another way to think about it is just like as cars became more popular. Um, you know, there was a need to put them somewhere. Now, you know, I think you can, it's hard to tell what caused what, but I've thought about this a bit, like, you know, the, the whole inner cities, you know, when we had white flight and, and um, freeway building, you know, there's a lot of talk about segre you know, about the impact on, on communities of color from freeway building and, you know, like, and, and, and how they, you know, not only just destroyed neighborhoods by building freeways on top of them, but then split those communities off from other parts of the city. And, and I, you know, I, some of that is, you know, as, as people left the city, then they needed to get back into the city for work. And so then you're building higher capacity roadways for them to get into work. And then you have to build parking so that when they drive in there, they can do that. And then once you've already messed up your city by doing this, then the only way to get around is by driving. And so then you, it becomes kind of obvious, oh, of course we have to require parking and everything because otherwise everyone who we've already made to drive will have to, you know, park somewhere. So I, I, it's, at some point I feel like it's not like always like in some evil plan, but like, you know, it certainly, once the ball got rolling, it kind of just almost seemed inevitable, I think. Is probably so it's sort of happened. like a snowball effect right like and that's what you've mentioned a lot um in this podcast right now which is the idea of like you know you build more parking then there's more cars and then there's mm -hmm. more cars and then all of a sudden you need more parking and then right. you have to make like bigger space provide more spaces for cars and for traveling and for cruising and for parking um so like Here's a really dumb question. I'm just going to bring it back because this is what almost everyone would say. Okay, I move into an apartment building. I move into a place, right? There's no parking. Where do I park my car? Right. Well, I don't, I mean, I, <laughs> I, mean, you, I mean, you might have to find a place to pay for it. You know, this is the, the, I mean, like, I, you know, like if you have a car uh, and you move somewhere and you want to keep it, um, most, most cities in the United States, the fact is you park it on the street for free because most right. cities allow that. 
and they also don't charge for it. Um, so that would be the, the, the first place you put it. Um, and if that's not possible, then, you know, you might have to rent a garage or, or move into, I mean, the other fact is that most of the places that exist do have a parking space. So, you know, like if, or I shouldn't say most, but in, in most communities, most homes, because of our requirements for the last 50 years, they have parking requirements. So if you, I mean, have on street, off-site parking, off street parking. So if you, you know, you, one of the keys here is, can we start building housing that allows the choice so that if you don't have a car, you can, or you can choose to make it a lifestyle change and not have a car, maybe a, maybe move closer to your place of work in a walkable community and not have to be dependent on that automobile so you can get rid of it. Um, where right now, in many places, that's not an option. You mm -hmm. have to pay for a parking space, not only where you live, but in every other transaction at the grocery store, you know, everywhere you go, you're paying some incremental piece that they're paying for parking upkeep. And, you know, so, so I think that's, um, you know, that, that's, that's the answer. You might have to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. pay for it. <laughs> No, that's interesting because um, in the book, they also talked about the commercial or like public, the villages or the towns or the government buying these commercial buildings for parking, just like mm -hmm. building these parking structures. And they right. said that was another option. And, and I want to bring it to this because I don't want to forget about it is the idea that like every place that the town makes money off of parking they should invest it back into right. the town so how can you ex expand more on that yeah yeah so so that is um what you're talking about would be, well so there's a couple things going on there so so as far as like building parking structures often um this is often done through like community development agencies you know where they they use that tax increment financing so like you're kind of betting on new development in a area, you build a parking garage that supposedly then makes the area more attractive. So you can build a hotel or a convention center or a, you know, a shopping center or whatever it is. And then the property taxes go up is the theory. And then that pays for the parking garage down the line and everyone is happy. Um, <laughs> another, another way this happens is, is that uh, in some places there are in lieu fees. So you're building an apartment building and then you, or an office building and you pay, uh, you pay a, instead of building parking yourself, you pay a per, you pay a fee, you know, $10,000. It's usually less than the cost of building a parking space, but you pay some amount. And then the city takes all that money and finances the building of a central parking garage. And I think this is actually like a pretty good idea. Like, 30, 40 years ago. Like it would have been a great thing if every city had done that initially instead of now. Now I feel like we're in a point where, um, you know, the, we should use money that we get from parking revenue or things to get to your, the second part of your question on other, because of the climate crisis and the housing crisis, like this, I don't feel like this is a, a sustainable model to like build parking structures because we need to kind of reduce car dependency and usage and they just promote that so uh what what, what you're what you mentioned is is often um the idea of like a parking benefit district which is the you know if you take on-street parking revenue whether it comes from meters or permits um or parking garage operations um you take the net the net revenue the amount of money that you made above the cost of implementing the program and return some or all of that money back to, to the community, you know, under some sort of community control. So if it's a business district, maybe the business association has a committee and they work with the city to say, okay, we want to spend this on fixing the sidewalk or putting in trash cans mm. or, um, you know, better, uh, you know, like sometimes that it could be good or bad, like more police, you know, I don't know if I would say that's a good <laughs> idea, but that, you know, or like, you know, like graffiti removal, like there's all sorts of things. And then I, but, but you can also use it for improving other access to modes, like, um, or, or even uh, a common use is to have meters on street and then uh, use money for meters to, or, uh, one of the uses is is to like subsidize in 
transit passes for workers in the commercial district. Mm. Because like, you know, like obviously if you're, if your workers are parking in the street, then, you know, your patrons can't park in the street. So if you can buy bus passes, if you can charge the patrons to park on street and then buy bus passes for your employees, then you have a win-win, like your employees get a benefit. And then the, the, um, the people have more places when they need to drive there to park. So there's, um, you know, that that's kind of the idea is, you know, you can, you should reinvest the parking revenue. A city shouldn't use it, in my opinion, like as like general fund things, because then they kind of get hooked on uh, the parking revenue being uh, part of this, their general budget. And so then they have an incentive to not actually reduce the amount of people who are driving. You don't want to, if, if you're making a lot of money on parking and you use it for, you know, like important every annual costs, and then you want to put a bus only lane and remove the parking, you're going to lose your revenue. And so there's a hesit there's going to be an internal hesitance, a conflict to like actually repurposing that space. So talking about like investment and how the city should invest in this, right? Um, revitalizing downtowns. How can parking help with that? Yeah, um, I think through these parking benefit districts. Uh, I have a, a intern, uh, Evan Kindler, working on a, um, a parking benefit district pamphlet and it, 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 or a, a guidebook for parking reformers. Oh. And he's done a lot of case studies on this where you, know, you can, um, through, I, so there's a couple, you know, one way is, you know, managing your on-street parking allows for a better environment, more access. Um, and, and so if you can charge your on-street parking to get this 85% occupancy, for example, and then reinvest that money into the neighborhood, I mean, into the, into the business district to some degree, either through better access, those things we talked about, better access or, or beautification, um, you know, the case study, there's several examples like Old Town Pasadena in in the Los Angeles area is the one in, in the book um, in the in high cost of free parking. Um, you know, they they put their meter district in in 1993. This it was a rundown kind of business district. The within the five years five years later, you know, they had uh, I think it was um, like doubled their their property tax revenue in that neighborhood and quadrupled sales tax as a proxy for, you know, for, for business activity, look at sales tax receipts. So like sales taxes went way up. Um, in Austin, they did a district like that as well, where the 10% increase in, in revenue. So I think that that's, you know, certainly, um, you know, making it easier for people to get to a place and, and using that money to increase access can absolutely help Alternately, uh, another thing is that by managing your on-street parking, there was a recent study uh, by Michael Manfield at uh, UCLA and uh, another researcher, CJ Gabby, that looked at like regionally in the Silicon Valley, if you didn't have to, if there wasn't as much required parking, they figured you could have like, I think there was 13,000 additional jobs that would be like a billion dollars in payroll, additional payroll in the Silicon Valley. So like, you know, like wow. it's not just like that. I mean, and obviously that's not like a specific like revitalizing my downtown, but obviously if you can bring more housing and jobs into a region, then you have more economic activity and, and that can lead to a boom on your business. I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. I was Tell gonna me. say, Another example I just would say is when I, the story that got me started, Division Street in Portland uh, was a street that was kind of like not, it was kind of, there was supposed to be a freeway that all ties together. In the seventies, they were gonna build a freeway down the street and this the commute, Portland stopped the freeway, but they had already like condemned a bunch of land. So when I moved here, like in the early, like 2001, the street, you know, it had a few businesses on it, but there was also like, just parking lots or car lots or, you know, auto repair. It was kind of a yeah. funky street. They built all these apartments with no parking on the street. And like then divisions with, it was, it was like mixed use housing, you know, and like the, the restaurant row, like division street became like a, a nationally famous 
restaurant location. I mean, it was like, it was like, it was like part of Portland's like culinary boom was building th this housing, th this community that was like along this strip. Now they don't charge for parking there, but just to say, you know, like how using your land better and not requiring it all to be for cars can lead to um, business benefits. So here's the thing, right? We're talking a lot about cities, right? And we yeah. talked a little bit about suburbs. And it sounds great because, for example, in Valley Stream, everyone wants to revitalize the, the downtown area. And everybody's trying right. to see how they can bring more businesses in. And they want more people to come and work in Valley Stream, right? Do they want more people to come and live in Valley Stream? I don't know. That's a little bit iffy, right? But... Here's the thing. Yes, we want more people to come to the downtown area. We want more people to come and work, right? But then people say things like, oh, well, they're going to park their cars on the street. If we, you know, they would need to relax some of the parking ordinances, right? Because one of the, like I said in the beginning, one of the parking ordinances is no overnight parking. Um, and the reasons for that have been different based on the politician. But the big ones is street cleaning, but street cleaning, street cleaning is not every day. <laughs> and the other one that they said is they want to um, discourage illegal housing. So like two families living in the same house, stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? What about when people, I'm sure I, I will let you tell us why you think your town wanted the required parking, right? But at least in my town, a lot of people say, well, first of all, like, we don't want too many people living here, first of all. Second of all, then you have cars on the street and it's unsightly. What do we, like, what can I say to that? <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it, that's an interesting one because, you know, there's always, people rarely argue about parking in good faith, in my opinion. For example, like, you know, if you talk about the, you know, you want to remove on in, 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 in the converse, if you talk, I've heard people say we should remove all on street parking. And then some people say, well, no, like restricting the street space makes it safer. And, you know, like, so like, like there's, there's always an argument of like why you should keep the parking around. Um, and in this case though, it's, it's ironic that you have a, a city that like, doesn't want to let people park so it kind of would make you question like what's really the reason there and and you mentioned parking parking is allowed during the day mm -hmm. so i mean why it's would allowed it for like short like periods of time uh -huh. for non-residents so like for example if i want to have friends come over and hang out with me during the day right right they would need to move their cars every two to three hours mm -hmm. so it's it's almost, but, it's very difficult to find a parking space for the whole day and it's impossible to park at night. Right, right. Well, so I mean, like, obviously if it's unsightly, like then you would assume that there should be, I guess I would say there should be no parking there. I mean, I, I that's, I mean, I, it doesn't, those, those answers, I, I, I mean, in my opinion, you know, people want to require parking. One is like kind of this idea that like, you know, they, they feel like they need it they're going to need it. That's usually how, why it would be required. Now, I don't, you know, in the case of like using a parking restriction, you know, to not allow people to park. I mean, I think that's something you more, more likely often see like in a, in a gated community or a private community, private plan community. A lot of times like, mm. you know, an HOA won't allow on street parking. Uh, and I, I have to say, I would say my, my thought would be that's an, an ex, like kind of an exclusionary, tactic or or exclusive tactic you know what i mean like you're trying to, to well they did the say that of... they're like we're trying <sighs> to keep people out um so that's i mean it's it's really interesting because can you have both can you keep people out and can you have a revitalized downtown can you keep people out and can you attract people to work in the town right well i mean yeah you can i mean you know there are i, I wouldn't advocate for this you know but i mean sometimes places will you know have like an off they'll have a parking satellite parking and shuttle workers mm -hmm. in or find ways to you know like to i, I was just reading a um 
a story uh, from Virginia Beach. You know, I read a lot of parking news and there's like a Atlantic Park. I don't know what any of these places are, but they want to build like some new stuff, some commercial things. And, and the neighbors nearby are really like, they want to require there to be a lot of on-site parking in that commercial development because they don't want, they say it's for safety reasons for the workers. They don't want the workers to be walking into their neighborhood, you know, like at night. But I mean, you kind of got to wonder, like, you know, does it really, do you think your neighborhood is unsafe for people to walk into? Or do you think the people who are going to, who might be walking into your neighborhood, you think are unsafe would seem to me to be the, the real subtext there. So like, it's like, so there might require that. So I mean, I, sure, if your community wants to build a bunch of structured parking so that they can, you know, but that's, that's going to be tremendously expensive. And yeah. so I don't think you can, or I think you should. <laughs> So it's interesting because uh, a previous podcast was about exclusionary zoning and housing. And it seems that there's a lot of intersection, obviously, between parking regulations and housing and zoning regulations. And mm -hmm. I remember um, the expert in exclusionary zoning said basically like any zoning works to exclude somebody, works to exclude some groups. Would you say it's the same for parking? Uh, I mean, yeah, gen in general, where, where it counts. I mean, obviously if you're requiring parking out in the middle of nowhere, like, does it matter? But I mean, I think like, yeah, I, I think that they go, they go hand in hand. In Portland, we recently kind of got rid of our exclusionary we we got rid of our our single family quote unquote single family housing um so now starting it goes into effect in july uh fourplexes uh market rate fourplexes will be allowed pretty much everywhere six plexes with affordability requirements and there's no parking required mm. um you wouldn't be able to do that you know so the city could say we're gonna we're gonna allow you to build a fourplex but you have to have one or two parking spaces per per home and the fact is it's never almost it might work some places but many places it's not going to work so this is kind of like a backdoor way to to restrict it there's an example um i had looked up which was um it's uh parma parma ohio which is near cleveland this is in the high cost of free parking they had a re uh, requirement for multifamily housing that was like 2.5 spaces per mm. apartment and and that was like there was a court case Actually, didn't look in like what the court case was necessarily about, but but you know it's like it was basically to keep it effectively prevented any any affordable housing from ever being built. You know, like oh. and and, and uh, so yeah, I mean, there's always an exclusion, and, and you got to think it also it, it who it impacts more. So like the cost if you're building a market rate or a, a high end unit, a home, the the cost of the parking is proportionally you know some percentage for 10 10 percent you know mm -hmm. and 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 then but if you're building an affordable project usually you're getting your you know part of why it's affordable you're bringing the cost down or it's a smaller home but the parking space cost is the same so that's going to be a higher percentage of the cost of the housing you know than it would be you know elsewhere and then you also think like for the people who are moving into affordable housing, right? Like, okay, so for a high income earner, the cost that they're paying for that parking that you're requiring is a small percent, is a relatively small percentage. But for a low income earner, the parking costs the same, right? <laughs> but yep. then you're making them pay a higher percentage of their of their their wealth or their income on that parking. And then to compound it even one more level, you look at car ownership rates, right? And so the, the wealthier and the wider you, your household is, the more likely it is to own a car or the more cars it's likely to own. And so if you're making everyone pay for two cars, two parking spaces per household, you know, but only, you know, the wealthiest households are owning two cars, then you're charging everyone else an additional parking space for a car that they might not own. Um, so it's like, really, I think absolutely, you can just like, logically, it's a it it lines up, you know, who are you trying to, to attract into a neighborhood? Yeah. So there is no such thing as free parking. 
<laughs> We're all paying for it. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think it's a there's not free. Yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> in, in a volcano, I, I like to joke, you know, like if you could we could push the cars into a pit or something, then you know, maybe that's it's funny. Free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. So in, in what you've, I mean, you've worked a lot with this personally in your travels, right? Um, what can you, can you tell us based on, this is just opinion based, based on your experience. Like, for example, you were talking about the story about the people in the neighborhood who wanted the requirements. Mm -hmm. Is that usually the way the the opinion tilts towards like more restrictive requirements or is, does that well, depend on the context? Like do the, you mean the like, do, do public you, opinion do, do you members? Yes. I, public mean, I, think, opinion. I think so. Um, you know, I think yes, but that's because I think that the public opinion is often, you know, has been, the, the, there's been no, no concerted effort to like really to, to change people's perception of this or to educate them. So we actually, when you asked like, why did I, I, I mentioned why I started um, Portlanders for parking reform, but then I realized like there was no effort to like really push this and help help people to, to, to kind of understand uh, these costs and impacts more generally. And that's why I started the parking reform because I think that that really when you like people, their first instinct, like mine was many years ago, was like I would never have questioned why there was parking. And I and if you told me there when I owned a car, if you told me that they were going to build no parking, I would be like, that's crazy. Why are you doing that? But then once once I once I learned the cost of it and 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 the impact you know, I might still not really, I'm not, I might not start, like people aren't going to join, you know, uh, at, they're not going to go necessarily argue against it, but it does, it, they, 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 they might not demand the parking be required as much. I think like if, you, you know, I, I think I'm optimistic. I think most people are kind of like intellectually honest. And when you point out this cost, like they have to kind of come to terms with, you know, that it's not great. And that, that actually is not a politically, like it kind of crosses some political boundaries because, mm -hmm. because there's, there's, there's a social uh, a reason that, that resonates with me. Like I want more inclusive and accessible communities. You know, uh, I care about climate change. Um, but there's also like, you know, a business and and kind of libertarian angle to this too of like, you know, why are you, this is a, a, a regulation that adds to the cost of everything, it reduces profitability, it suppresses business, you know, like, why are you telling someone what to do on their project? So there is like, you know, I, I think that if we try that actually there, it's, it's most people just have, it's like, it's like a, a, a green field or an a population susceptible, you know, like, like the, yeah. the, the, it hasn't been, it hasn't been pushed very far. Um, part of that is like, it's always considered a third rail, like uh, uh, city staff and elected officials, they get so much grief about parking that, that their tendency is to just be apologetic and to kind of mm -hmm. do whatever the public wants. But I, I have found at least personally that if you engage people a little bit, you know, you win, you win enough that, that it makes a difference. So, okay. So how do you engage people? How do you do this? How do you share this knowledge? How do you persuade? How do you influence policy? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, simple question. Yeah, no, it's, it's easy. <laughs> One second. I'm going to close a blind real quick. So I'm getting <laughs> Okay. Less. No problem. <laughs> That way you can think a little bit about it. But uh, I, I just more, <laughs> I know what's going to happen here is that the, the sun is going to get to my eyes and then it's going to wash me out. Um, <laughs> so uh, or, in my opinion, it's organizing. Um, I have a background partly as a community, I mean, as a union organizer. Oh. And so... Um, so I, I, you know, and, and in that job, I, you know, learned you know, about just talking to people and 
finding out, connecting their issue to why they should, in the case of like, you know, union organizing, why they, why they wanted to have workplace democracy. <laughs> and, and so in this case, you know, <laughs> I think it's like, you know, you, you ever, many people have something they care about in their community and, t- and figuring out like what, like how parking impacts that issue for them, be it like, you know, maybe they're a cyclist or maybe they, love trees you know a lot a lot of a lot of what you might call nimbies love trees and you could say look if you make me build a bunch of parking i might have to cut down these trees and okay you know like maybe we shouldn't do that or um historic preservation uh you know like is another big one where you know hey you love this building but it's kind of obsolete in its use and if you want to use it for something else they can't because you're requiring all this parking if you didn't require parking you could keep the building, you know, or you could keep your main street. Um, environmentalists, you know, like there's always for one of the things I like about parking is there's like it ties into so many issues that there's there's like usually something someone cares about that you can connect to them. And so I think how you change the opinion is like you have to kind of just make the argument and let people know. And you know, you're not going to convince everybody you shouldn't even you know, and once if someone's really angry with you don't even bother but but like you know you might you're going to pick up some people on the edges and um yeah and then and then the next hard part is you know if you want to you know that's convincing people and then then you need to get them to 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 help you change the policy and that requires um letting them know how and when to to make their voice heard um, helping them know what to what they might say, and then uh, pestering them a little bit, like you know, like telling yeah. them, like, "Hey, did you send in your letter? You know, send in your letter. Go, did you sign up for testimony?" Or even like helping them to sign up for testimony. It's a little easier now. Everything's on Zoom. You know, yeah. it's a little easier to testify. But I think like just you know, it's just it's work, right? <laughs> is, is, is part of it. But you know, someone's got to. If you do it, I, it has impacts. Um, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I want to wrap up, but I want to give you the last word. If people watch this podcast, when people watch this podcast, um, what is the one thing you want them to take away from this? What is the one thing if they forget everything else? What is the one thing you want them to remember? Mm. Don't tell them to read the book. <laughs> no, I think that people should really just uh, think about the problems we're facing as a society right now with housing and and fire and climate, et cetera, and 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 understand that that you know we can this is one way we can start to it's it's a foundational change to to change your parking policy like a lot of the things that you want that we need to do to to make uh progress in these areas uh rec- can't are much much harder to do with the when we we have to accommodate cars and accommodate all the parking so like this is a it's a it's a kind of like you know, wonky topic, but, but it's, 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 it's a very important and foundational thing. So like, I think that you should, uh, people should, should keep it in mind all the time that if they're, if they're, if it, they can't, they're not going to be able to necessarily get from point A to point B in their policy objectives without um, taking this on or, or, or this, this is going to make it a lot harder to do that. Perfect. Thank you so much for explaining all of this to us um, and for being passionate about it. <laughs> so thank you thank so you much, Tony, me. and enjoy the Portland weather. Thank you. And I may contact you again when parking comes up again, because there's developments going up. So we well, might have you back. <laughs> anytime. Anytime. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you, you too.